when there's a big pandemic virus outbreak, it kind of makes you worried about doing something as simple as just going to the grocery store or any place where there are crowds. So what about this coronavirus that is breaking out across the globe? We're going to talk about it on today's Hot Zone. This is the Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Make no mistake, this is though an emergency in China. But it has not yet become a global health emergency. Uh, the WHO say it's not yet a global emergency. Do you think, in your opinion, it could become one? I, I do, and, and quite quickly. The WHO decided that they didn't have enough information as of this week to formally declare it. Not entirely sure about a lot of what's going on. Uh, we know, for example, that the U.S. consulate was told to evacuate, but they haven't been able to. Uh so my wife sent me to the store to get eggs and bread, which, of course, means I'm coming home with cheesy doodles and Red Bull. But... You know, it makes you think when you hear about all this, this worriedness around the globe, uh, of this new virus that's out and people in China dying in the streets and China quarantining 56 million people and all this. You know, how bad is this virus anyway? Because there's a lot of people that have been touching this shopping cart before me and it kind of makes me wonder. So fortunately here in our little town in Panama, we've got one of the foremost experts on killer viruses that lives here. So I went and talked to her. Her name is Ellen Jo Barron. Check this out. I'm Ellen Jo Barron, Emerita Professor of Pathology from Stanford University. There are a lot of coronaviruses, and oftentimes when we get a cold, it's a coronavirus. So normally this sort of virus, which is an RNA-type single-stranded virus, doesn't cause very serious disease. And they're present in all kinds of animals, uh, but in the world, they're primarily found in bats. And they move from location to location as bats migrate around. And from bats, they then infect other animals. So the other animals in the SARS outbreak were civet cats. And other animals in the MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome outbreak, were uh, camels, bats to camels, and then camels to people. And this new coronavirus, which is very similar to SARS with regard to its genetic composition, uh, is bats to what we believe are a certain kind of snake that was being sold in the animal market in Wuhan province, China. Um, why is it that it seems like almost all of these viruses originate in China? Uh, there's a lot of interaction between people and animals, live animals in China, animal markets, etc. Mm -hmm. So there's a good concentration of a lot of people and a lot of animals together in one place which facilitates the animal-to-human transmission. Mm. The human-to-human -human transmission is not that robust, and so not that many people are, nowadays we will get it, but only from close contact. And it doesn't live in the air for very long because the coronavirus is a lipid bilayered enveloped virus, which means it's got this fat outside and if the fat outside dries out, which it does in the air, then the thing isn't contagious anymore. Okay. So why is everybody going crazy about this particular This particular virus? one? First of all, SARS was a very similar looking virus. And there was person-to-person -person transmission with SARS. Uh, and the death rate during the SARS outbreak was about 10%. Uh, and that's pretty high 
for a virus, a respiratory virus. And so people are concerned that this one may spread person to person in the same way and maybe have that kind of a case fatality rate. But actually, it seems so far to have only about a 3% case fatality rate, which is more similar to the MERS coronavirus variant than to the SARS variant. What would the fatality rate be for like a normal flu virus, that just every day? Uh, it, it, it depends on the kind of person. So fatality for flu runs as high as 10% in older incapacitated type people, immunocompromised people, and maybe babies. So is this one far worse than a typical flu virus? Or far less. This one's not even that big a deal then? Theoretically, not that serious a disease. And actually, right now, with there's been um, about 8,000 cases known, eight or 9,000. Uh, people, in general, don't get very sick. So it's not even as bad as flu. Most people have very mild disease. So we're seeing video out of China of people dying in the streets, people, uh, uh, you know, in hazmat suits, treating folks that are packed into the hospital, just, just frantic. Well, anybody who has any kind of respiratory sy symptoms now is concerned that they have this virus. And so I think the panic is much overblown. And yes, the authorities are wearing complete um, hazmat type suits so that they don't become infected because they're thinking how infectious SARS was. But it's not like SARS, and it's certainly not like Ebola, where the case fatality rate originally at the very beginning of the outbreak was up to 90%. Now it's about 50% in general, overall. So there have been more deaths from Ebola this year than there have been from this virus. Why aren't people freaking out about Ebola? Uh, it seems to be contained in parts of Congo, West Congo and Uganda, and really those people don't travel like people from China do. So the, the world worries about this virus because Chinese people are traveling everywhere. That's why we have a case in Chicago in the U.S. and a case in Washington, and other countries now throughout the world are seeing individual people with cases who traveled. One of the reasons that it can spread that way, it's sort of interesting. The virus is, as I said, a pretty mild disease in general, so people don't know they're sick. They don't feel that sick. So they're out with their friends. They're out with their family. They're traveling, feeling fine, and they're, they can spread it during that period. Ebola, by the time you have the virus in such a way that you could spread it, you're so sick that you're flat on the ground, and the only people near you are caregivers and your, your family. And in this case, you're out walking around. I see. So... Um... And Ebola has been around for a lot longer, and I guess people have maybe tired of hearing about it. Is that... Yeah, and it doesn't come to the North world or what we call the developed world too much. It stays there, whereas Chinese people are traveling in all parts of Europe, United States, everywhere. Right, it's traveled to Japan, now a dozen countries. Korea. That have got cases. That's right. Um, so how would you rate the Chinese government's response to this so far? I'm giving them full points. I think they've done a wonderful job. It took them months to tell us about SARS. I mean, everyone already knew before China came out and said, oh yeah, by the way, we have a virus, and shared the virus with other scientists. This one, it took them weeks. And they sequenced the genome and put it up on international sequencing sites as soon as they did that so that everyone in the world who was capable could also sequence other viruses and determine how closely related they were and develop a diagnostic test, which we now have. CDC has developed a sequencing test, and they're releasing the, um, the protocol to all public health laboratories in the U.S. as we speak. Okay, good. So you don't think it's as, as big as a... You don't think it's worth worth panicking over? This is no, a, and I know it's China not going to be a has, Spanish flu of nineteen eighteen. No, nothing like that. And China has has quarantined three big cities now, millions and millions of people. But that is again over cautious response 
And you got to give China credit for doing that. That must cost them a lot of money. And yet they're stepping up. So I think China is to be congratulated this time around. Much more transparency than we have seen coming from them before. Good. Okay. Um, what is the most current progress you're making on the Ebola uh, vaccine? How, how are you seeing that? My understanding of the Ebola vaccine is that there is a vaccine, at least one that works very well and two others that work pretty well. And the problem now is getting it distributed in those countries because of internal fighting and warfare that's going on there. And the terrorist groups are targeting healthcare workers deliberately. So people are afraid to go in there and try to distribute vaccine. So we have vaccines that work. That's good. Uh, so what would you say is the biggest biological threat that the world faces right now? Any, is there something that people aren't talking about? Not that I know of. Okay. We always worry about a horrible flu. And this year is interesting because instead of flu A, which is normally the major circulating flu virus early in the season, which this is in the northern hemisphere, the circulating virus is flu B, Victoria, which nobody expected to happen. But it's covered in our vaccine, in our flu shots, and people should get their flu shot to be protected by it. Do you but think it's worth it to get it. the flu shot? Oh, absolutely. Everybody who can get a flu shot should get a flu I've shot. I've never had a flu shot. Chuck. <laughs> never in my life. <laughs> you have to get a flu I shot. I don't get sick. I, I, oh, you know, wait till you get it. And well, then you'll yeah. say, oh my God, I wish I had the flu yeah, shot. Probably. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I did get that swine flu one time. but Yeah, was, <laughs> exactly. I don't know if that would have been even covered. By no, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. But Okay, well, great. Thank you very much. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.